Our next speaker is Chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, which is responsible for authorization and oversight of VA, the second largest department in the federal government. Since winning a special election for his Florida congressional seat in 2001, he quickly established himself as a strong advocate for veterans, supporting positive changes to concurrent receipt and requirements for a greater data sharing between military and veterans clinics. He is also a strong supporter of the Defense Department and the global war on terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Representative Jeff Miller. Thank you very much, Commander. It's great to be here in Houston, Texas, home to the state having one and a half million veterans, kind of like my home state of Florida. And I say hello to my colleagues and good friends from Florida that I had a chance to meet with a little earlier. It's great to see you. Commander Couts, I say thank you for all of your hard work, your dedication, your leadership in the past year. Uh, your continued service to not only this nation, uh, but to the veterans of this nation as well. And I also want to say, as the Secretary has already said, thank you for what all of you uh, continue to do every day on behalf of those who have worn the uniform of this country. You know, nearly, nearly, ha nearly a century ago now, I guess, it was in 1919, when your organization was formed, we had a, a pretty unresponsive government, a bureaucracy that was not helping to provide the benefits that the veterans of this nation had earned for their service. But now, 94 years later, I would say that our government has come a long way in its treatment of veterans, but the issue is that there is still a whole lot more work that remains to be done. And that's why organizations such as the American Legion are so important, both in the country and on Capitol Hill as well. You provide guidance and a voice to those that in many cases left so much behind on the battlefield. And whether it was your efforts in helping our government create the, the U.S. Veterans Bureau back in 1921, or just as short as the 112th Congress, our last Congress, you were very helpful in helping us pass a host of initiatives that were designed to better serve and protect our veterans. It was the Legion support and its council that helped make these crucial bills the law of the land. And that's why I come here today as the chairman of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs to tell you a little bit about the priorities of the 113th Congress, which is ongoing right now. Over the last six months, Republicans and Democrats, we probably are the most bipartisan committee on Capitol Hill, but we have all worked together to execute a comprehensive legislative and oversight agenda that has really two, two overarching goals, helping veterans while improving accountability and efficiency at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And you just heard from the Secretary about what the Department is trying to do as they serve the veterans of this nation. On the legislative front, our committee has already passed 13 bills out of the committee, and in those 13 bills were 50 different pieces of legislation. Highlights of our legislative agenda include issues like putting veterans funding first. Right now, in a time where you hear about government shutdowns and you hear about things like continuing resolutions, the VA should not have to worry, nor should the veterans of this country worry whether or not their funding will come in a timely fashion. The Congress moved quickly a couple of years ago to put a lot of the VA budget on a two-year budget, but we left about 17 percent 
that's not on a two-year budget. And I think it's critical that we put 100% of the VA budget on a two-year cycle so when we have things like we're about to have when we return to Washington uh, in about 10 days, that we don't have a CR that affects your funding nor the threat of a government shutdown that would affect your funding as well. The GI Bill Tuition Fairness Act would actually expand educational opportunities for veterans by allowing them to attend any state institution around the country at an in-state rate. When you wore the uniform of this country, when you wore the uniform of this country, you did not just represent your home state, you represented all 50 states. And so we are asking states to join us, and many have, by offering in-state tuition to our veterans, and we think that it is a good way for states to say thank you for those that went forward into service for this nation. We're, car we're carrying a bill that helps solve, as the Secretary has already said, what continues to be VA's most challenging and persistent problem, the, the backlog. I mean, you can describe it a hundred different ways, but it is a huge mountain that has over time gotten to a point where it almost looks insurmountable. And so we've established a piece of legislation that basically puts a framework in place that uses the VA, VSOs, the veterans community in helping the VA to solve that backlog that exists out there. I want the VA to hit their goal of removing the backlog that exists out there by 2015. I know that is a goal that you share as well, and I certainly hope that the President shares it as well. Now, some say that since VA has made progress in chipping away at the backlog, we should stop leaning so hard on the Department of Veterans Affairs in getting them to eliminate it. Look. The over half a million veterans that are still out there in a backlog situation would probably disagree with removing the pressure from VA. Now, some have criticized our task force by saying it's adding an undue burden, an additional burden for VA to accomplish while they're trying to reduce the backlog. But I say this, think about it. Government bureaucrats under both Republican and Democrat administrations created the backlog. So it's only natural to solicit help from leaders outside of VA, those in the private sector and the VSO community, to help solve this problem. Under the bill, the task force would provide recommendations for improving VA's claim processing operations within 60 days of its first meeting and then continue to work with VA as they try to reduce that backlog. Now, to those that are skeptical about this approach, consider this. VA leaders have been promising to reduce the backlog since the first term of George W. Bush. And look where we are today. Again, we are all pulling for VA to hit that goal of 2015. But I say that by establishing a backlog task force, we can find a common sense way of making sure that they meet that goal of 2015. But let me tell you this, legislation alone is not going to solve the problem that exists out there today. It will take collective effort from the administration, from Congress, from veteran service organizations like the American Legion and the American people. And with that in mind, we're calling on President Obama and his administration to take a few steps to help us achieve these goals. The first step centers on leadership at the top. President Obama has got to become personally involved in ending the backlog. Just as members of Congress on both sides of the aisle and many in the VSO community have implored him to do on multiple occasions, 
We all know that the backlog predates the Obama administration, but that's all the more reason that we're going to need the President's help if we're going to solve the problem. Now, the President did take time a short time ago to talk to veterans about the backlog that currently exists, and I commend him for doing that. But in listening to the President's speech, I was struck by what he did not say, by what he did not talk about. He made no reference to the off-sided 2015 goal that the Department has set for itself, even though he is the only person with the power to make sure that VA lives up to its word. And the President did not pledge, he did not pledge to ensure that VA and DOD work together to finally have one joint individual health electronic record, even though there is near unanimous consent that such a step would, in fact, help shrink the backlog. As Commander-in-Chief, President Obama is the only person in position to hold DOD and VA leaders directly accountable, and his involvement and his personal leadership is essential to solving these critical problems. We've asked for the President's help in addressing these issues, and I would say that Part of the problem is contributing to the backlog as well as an emerging pattern that exists out there today of preventable deaths and lapses in care at VA medical centers across this country. VA's long and well-documented history of failure to hold poorly performing executives accountable and consider a few recent examples. After persistent management failures led to a deadly Legionnaire's disease outbreak in the VA Pittsburgh healthcare system, the VA Pittsburgh director received a perfect performance review. And the regional director overseeing VA Pittsburgh was rewarded with a $63,000 bonus. Despite three patient deaths, VA's Inspector General linked to widespread mismanagement, the former Atlanta VA Medical Center director received $65,000 in bonuses over four years. And a VA health official in New York pocketed nearly $26,000 in bonuses while overseeing chronic misuses of insulin pens that potentially exposed hundreds of veterans to bloodborne illnesses. These are but a few instances of what seems to have become standard operating procedure at VA. Management failures that border on the criminal accompanied by rewards rather than consequences or accountability. Now the vast majority of the 300,000 employees at VA are dedicated and are hardworking. They deserve better than to have the reputation of their organization dragged through the mud by a bunch of executives too busy patting themselves on the back to take responsibility for their own incompetence. Both Republicans and Democrats on our committee stand united. We stand united against this pattern of rewarding failure. That's why we've approved legislation that would ban VA executive bonuses for five years. Until we have complete confidence, complete confidence that VA is holding executives accountable rather than rewarding them for their mistakes, no one should get a bonus, period. Commander Couts, I know you have been very engaged in the issue of VA bonuses, and I appreciate your leadership. But we can't change VA's culture on our own. Believe me, for years, Congress has tried in vain to compel VA leaders to implement meaningful steps to hold poorly performing managers accountable. Unfortunately, the department officials see more intent on protecting and rewarding failing executives than sending a powerful message that substandard care for veterans will not be tolerated. Applause 
And that's why we've asked the president to help us end the culture of complacency among some in VA and replace it with a culture of accountability through every corner of its organization. VA executives who fail in their jobs should not get bonuses. They should be disciplined or fired. We're also calling on the Department of Veterans Affairs to be more transparent with Congress. A major part of that is providing information when we request it. Currently, VA is sitting on nearly 100 requests for information made by both Republicans and Democrats from our committee. And some of these requests are over one year old. The leisurely pace with which VA has responded to these requests and in some cases not even responding at all, is a major impediment to the basic oversight responsibilities of the committee on which I chair. When the department drags its feet in providing information requested by your Congress, it inhibits our ability to ensure that America's veterans are receiving the care and the benefits that they earned. So a few months ago, my good friend and ranking Democrat on the committee, Mike Michaud, and I decided to let everybody know just how difficult it has been for us to engage with VA in a transparent conversation. We set up a website called Trials in Transparency to keep a running record of information requests that VA has yet to answer. You deserve a VA that sets the standard for openness, for honesty and for transparency. And when the department fails to do so, the public needs to know about it. That's why we established that website, Trials in Transparency. And finally, while we're talking about honesty, it's well past time for VA to develop an honest plan to get veterans bearing the invisible wounds of war the mental health care that they need. Most veterans seeking mental health care wait an average of 50 days, 50 days before receiving an evaluation. That figure amounts to thousands of our veterans in need today. It takes courage for a veteran to stand up and ask for help. They deserve more than simply to be told to stand in line. In the last six years, VA's mental health care staff and budget have grown by nearly 40 percent, and the Secretary alluded to that earlier. Unfortunately, these significant increases have not resulted in significant performance increases because for the past 12 years, an average of 18 to 22 veterans take their lives every day in this country. And it's not enough that the veteran suicide problem isn't getting worse. It isn't getting much better either. And that means there's more work for us to do when Congress returns on improving veterans' mental health care. In order to truly maximize mental health care access for today's veterans, VA has got to embrace an approach to care delivery that treats veterans where and how they want, not just where and how VA wants to provide the care. That's why I'm working on draft legislation that would give veterans in need access to mental health care treatment, whether those services come from VA or outside the system in the private sector. And some have said that this could undermine VA's health care. But this isn't about supplanting VA's health care system, it's about supporting its system. Furthermore, expanding access to mental health care services for veterans in need is a good thing, whether it comes from the Department of Veterans Affairs or it comes from somewhere else. Though our nation is approaching the end to more than a decade of war, the fight to ensure you and your brothers and sisters in arms get the care and benefits you have earned is not. Breaking VA's benefits backlog, expanding access 
to veterans mental health care and changing the culture at VA is not going to be easy. But the fact is we owe it to the men and women who braved bullets and bombs over there to make sure that it's done right here. So the House Committee on Veterans Affairs is united in this cause. I ask for your help. Please join us. God bless you. God bless our veterans. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you.